Praise be Jesus Christ. We'll go ahead and start this lesson off with the uh, student prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, taken from the St. Thomas Aquinas student prayer card. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Take from me the double darkness in which I have been born, and obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give me a keen understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations, and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, this lesson is on the divine mercy of God. And as you can see here on uh, this side of the board, we have the Old Testament uh, writings, uh, reading our scriptures from Genesis to Ezekiel, and then on this side we have the New Testament. And, and there's one thing that's common in all of these scriptures, um, and, and, it, and it ties into what we pray in the Chapel of Divine Mercy. In the Chapel of Divine Mercy, we pray, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. So this is an address to the Father. We're praying to the Father for the sake of his sorrowful passion, the passion of the Son, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. And this prayer that we pray um, on the chaplet goes back to the simple Jesus prayer. It's, it's a prayer that's uttered by the blind man. You know, um, it, it's uttered throughout Scripture where we simply say, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the same type of thing where we make a declaration. You know, we, we say, Jesus Christ, and then we define, you know, we profess who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. And then what is our request? Have mercy on me. And then we make a statement of who we are, a sinner. So Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's such a complete prayer. And we see in the Chaplet of Divine Mercy that we have that same element. For the sake of His sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. So in these scriptures, um, we have one thing that's common. We have the words, for the sake, for the sake of something, um, because of something, something else is going to happen. So for the sake of something, this will happen. Uh, for instance, in the Old Testament, God will say, for the sake of my servant, whoever, I will do this. Um, for the sake of this, I'm going to do this. And the same thing's true then in the New Testament. Uh, Christians will be built willing, I will do this for the sake of this. Um, and it's very similar to what we see just in our own human relationships. Um, you know, whether it be a parent-child relationship, because you made straight A's, or for the sake of good grades, I will give you a reward. I will uh, give you a higher allowance, or, or I will buy you a car, whatever it is. Um, for the sake of something, this is going to happen. So what we want to remember in all of these scriptures as we look, especially in the Old Testament, is we want to remember that God, our Father, keeps His promise. Um, you know, when we think of our, our earthly fathers, um, you know, pretty much they keep their promise to us. There are times that our earthly fathers do not keep their promise because our earthly fathers are not perfect. But our heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus Christ says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, as much as even our earthly fathers have worked so hard to keep their promises, you know, my own father, you know, when he said that he would do something, he did it. If it was a positive thing, if he said, you know, son, I'm going to do this for you, and it's a positive thing, then he tried to keep his promise, or he did keep his promise. And if he said, I will punish you if you do this, he kept his promise even in a negative sense. So even our earthly fathers know that they keep their promises in the positive sense and in the negative sense. How much more so then will our Heavenly Father, our Father who art in heaven, how, how much so will our perfect Father keep his promise? He will keep it perfectly. So when God says, for the sake of this, I will do this, he is making a promise to someone 
and he will keep it. So as we look through the Old Testament, we're going to kind of identify. Now, there's a lot of scriptures here, so I recommend, uh, I recommend going to uh, Link to Liturgy, linktoliturgy.com, and uh, go ahead and look up the lesson that says Divine Mercy Sunday. It's a feast day. It'll be in the feast day section, Divine Mercy Sunday. This is the second Sunday after Easter, and, and you can kind of read along with this lesson, which is what I'm going to, instead of reading all these scriptures, we're just going to kind of go briefly through all of these. So, but with everyone we're looking at, who, who, is, who is this addressed to, especially in the Old Testament? And, and, and what's going to be promised for the sake of what? So in, in this first one, you remember this first story, Genesis 18. This is when we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're, we're spe uh, Abraham is saying, if there's only 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? And God says yes. And then Abraham kind of whittles the number down. And finally, Abraham says this. He says this in verse 32, 1832. He says, um, what if there's at least 10 righteous people? And God says, for the sake of those 10, I will not destroy it. So in this case, God is speaking to Abraham. And he's saying, for the sake of 10 righteous if there's just ten righteous, I will save the city. I will not destroy the city. How powerful is that? If I just find ten righteous... Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were, were big cities. I'm not sure how big they were, but they were big cities. And God, in His mercy, is willing to say, if I just find ten righteous, I won't destroy the city. Now, of course, those cities were destroyed, so there must not have been the ten righteous, because God keeps His promise. Uh, all right, moving on to Genesis 26, the same thing. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say, uh, for the sake of my servant Abraham. Now, if you remember, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Those are the patriarchs. And so, um, in this one, he's speaking to Isaac. And God is saying to Isaac, Isaac is Abraham's son. And he's saying, because of my servant... For the sake of my servant Abraham, your father, I am going to bless and multiply your descendants. I will bless and multiply. For the sake of my servant Abraham, Isaac, I will bless and multiply your offspring. Once again, this is a promise that God is making. He is showing his mercy. He's showing his love and his favor for the righteous and for his servants. You know, he's telling Abraham's son Isaac, because of your dad, and because of your dad's faith, I am going to bless you. Um, in 2 Samuel, um, what, what happens is this is addressed, or about David, and, it's, and he says, for the sake of the people, for the sake of the people, um, David is established as king. So, the, so David becomes king. For the sake of the people, God gives the people a king. Um, in 1 Kings 11, uh, this is now David. Um, and this is regarding David. And if you remember, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Well, then we have David and Solomon. So in, in this case, he's uh, addressing Solomon. And Solomon has, has uh, strayed away. Um, he has done, you know, some sinful things. And it says, for the sake of my servant David, for the sake of my servant David. And then he says, for the sake of my servant, uh, for the sake of Jerusalem. For the sake of David, for the sake of Jerusalem. Solomon is spared a full punishment that he was being given. So it says this in, in 1 Kings 11. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is what you want, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I enjoined on you. So Solomon has shown disobedience. Um, so also what we see in this is a matter of justice and mercy. God has to be just. Solomon has, has strayed from the statutes, and he has not kept the covenant of God. 
So God says to Solomon, I will deprive you of your kingdom. I'm going to deprive you of this kingdom, the kingdom of David. Um, and I will give it to your servant. But I will not do this during your lifetime. However, for the sake of your father, because of your father, Solomon, your father David, for the sake of your father David, it is your son whom I will deprive, nor will I take away the whole kingdom. So I'm not going to take away the whole kingdom. I will leave your son one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for Israel I will leave one tribe. So the promise here, Solomon has, has rejected the covenant. He has fallen away from the laws of God. And so justice has to be done. The justice is, I'm going to take away the kingdom. The mercy of God is that I will leave one tribe. So God does not destroy everything. He always will leave the hope. And this hope is his mercy. Second Kings. Now this is uh, during, uh, right after the, the reign of Ahab. Now, during the reign of Ahab, this was the darkest moment of Israel's history. As you can see, they, they have kind of fallen here. You have Abraham, Isaac, David, Solomon is already starting to reject the covenant. And then, and then you have Ahab. And when, and when we move into the period of Ahab, um, there's really just been a complete rejection of God um, and even the worship of false prophets. So this is the, the word from, from 2 Kings. It says, In the fifth year of Yoram, Son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jer Jer Jeroram, son of Jesaphat, king of Judah, became king. He was 32 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He conducted himself like the kings of Israel in the line of Ahab. So he, he was conducting himself in sin and depriving himself in the people. Um, since the sister of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the Lord's sight. Even so, even so, the Lord was unwilling to destroy Judah because of, or for the sake of his servant David, for he had promised that he would leave him a lamp in the Lord's presence at all times. So in this case, during the time of Ahab and in the line of the kings after Ahab, there had been tons of evil in Israel, a complete rejection of God. And so justice says there has to be a punishment here. But even in this case, for the sake of my servant David, for the sake of my servant David, I am going to, I am unwilling to destroy Judah. So I won't destroy Judah. And it says, I will leave a lamp. I'm going to leave a glimmer, a lamp. I won't destroy. I'll leave one tribe. I'll leave Judah as the tribe. Um, now when we move into this category of the Psalms, the Psalms are especially important uh, to the Christian. Um, and, and as a Catholic, we pray the Psalms all the time through the Liturgy of the Hours. And it's so important, you know, if, if we're not accustomed to praying the Liturgy of the Hours, that we start doing this. This is very much a tradition of our church, and it's the way we pray. It's the way church prays. Um, the, the, the words of the Psalms are obviously King David. Uh, King David wrote these psalms. These were placed on his heart, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But we also know that in these psalms, they're also speaking of Christ. And they're also speaking of the church. So anytime we pray the Liturgy of the Hours, anytime we chant or say these psalms, um, we are uniting ourselves with the voice of Christ, and we're uniting ourselves with the voice of the church. So keeping that in mind, we want to... Look at the promises that our Father makes through the Psalms. Um, so Psalm 79, 9 says, Help us, God our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us, pardon our sins, for your name's sake. So for the sake of your name, Lord, for the sake of your holy name, it says, deliver us. So God's going to deliver us just because of his name. And he's going to pardon our sins. The holy name of God, which every knee will bend, every head will bow. The holy name of God, just because of his name. And we think, how important are names in our society? You know, sometimes we talk about name dropping. And, 
you know, if we're at a dinner or a lunch or we're just in, in conversation, oh yeah, I know so and so, and we drop these names um, as if these names will do something for us. Um, and sometimes they do. If you know so and so and you can prove that you know and so, using their name can be beneficial to you. How much more so then will the precious name of God, for the sake of His name, He will deliver us, He will pardon us. He gives us His word, He gives us His name. Um, now we move on to Psalm 79.9, it says, um, let's see, I'm sorry, let me read 20, let me go back, this one is actually here, so on 79.9 it should be say, name, deliver us, pardon us, or pardon our sins, okay, now we'll read 23.3. Uh, you, you restore my strength, you guide me along the right path for the sake of your name. So once again, just because of your name, God, just because of your name, you will lead me on the path, on the right path, and you will restore my strength. Lead me on the right path and restore my strength. Psalm 143.11 says, For your name's sake, for the sake of your name, Lord, give me life, and your justice lead me out of distress. So, for the sake of your name, give us life. Lead me out of distress. And we think about how desirable those things are, to be led on the right path, to have our strength restored, to be delivered, to be pardoned our sins, to give us life, and to lead us out of distress. God promises us that. Why? Simply because of His name, because of His holy name, because He is God and He is our Father. Now we're going to go ahead and look at these last two. Um, Isaiah. And this one's interesting because this is the time where the Jewish people um, have, have just been um, taken over. And, and what the do Lord does is the Lord uses Cyrus. Cyrus is uh, one of the rulers of Persia. So he's, he's, he's a, a Gentile. And God is going to use a Gentile king to liberate uh, the Jewish people. Um, and he says, the short part of this is, For the sake of Jacob, my servant. So because of Jacob... My servant, I'm going to liberate you. Um, I'm going to give Cyrus, the king of Persia, the ability to liberate you. So in this case, our Lord is using even someone who is a pagan, someone who is uh, outside um, the chosen people to liberate the chosen people. In Ezekiel 20:44. Um, it says, You shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you thus, for my name's sake, and not according to your evil conduct and corrupt actions, O house of Israel, says the Lord. So the house of Israel has, has abandoned God. They have become corrupt, corrupt actions, evil conduct. And God says, You shall know that I am the Lord your God when I deal with you thus. I'm going to deal with you according to my name's sake, not according to your evil conduct and your corrupt actions. So I'm not going to give you the full punishment. I should. I'm not going to give you the full justice. I'm going to be just, but I'm going to give you some mercy. Um, and, and he says he'll do this for the sake of his name. So for the sake of, for the sake of my name, God is saying, um, I am not going to deal with you as harshly as I should. So I will lessen your punishment. Okay, and what we see over here, just kind of the common thread that we see here, is God is willing for the sake of His servant, for those that serve Him. You know, we see the servant Abraham, the servant David, the servant David, the servant Jacob. Because of my servants, I will bless, I will show mercy to others. For the sake of my people, the people I love, for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of holiness, 
for the sake of Jerusalem. So it's not just for the sake of an individual that I will do so much, show so much mercy, but it's also for the sake of the whole, for the sake of the community, for the sake of my people, for the sake of Jerusalem, I will show mercy. And then a, a third category is just for the sake of my name, just because I am God, the Almighty, just because I am your loving Father, I will show you mercy. I will lead you on the right path. I will restore your strength. I will deliver you, pardon your sins, give you life, lead you out of distress. I will liberate you. I will do this. So what we see in the Old, in the Old Testament, you know, many times we, we think of the Old Testament God as being very angry and fire and brimstone and, and uh, just all of these horrible images that, that we conjure up. And, and this is just truly a lie. Because when we see and we really study these scriptures, we see a very merciful, loving God. Do we see a God of justice? Of course we do. But we also see a merciful God that for the sake of so many things, for the sake of His servant, for the sake of the people, for the sake of His name, He will show mercy. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and move to the New Testament. So we'll, we'll just kind of move over here and, and we're going to see something just a little bit different here. And we'll kind of see this when we read the first one. And this is from the Beatitudes, so this is from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 5.10. Matthew 5.10 says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in this case, it's for the sake of righteousness, I'm going to be persecuted. So for the sake of righteousness, for righteousness... I am willing to be persecuted. So on the, on the Old Testament side we see basically for the sake of these ten righteous I will not destroy, for the sake of a servant I will bless and multiply, for the sake of the people I will give you a kingdom. And, it, and, it's, and it's God that's, that's, that's showing these mercy. On this side, it, it's, it, this, is, this is talking about the Christians. This is the talking about the Christians. Why are the Christians willing to be persecuted? Um, so in this one, we're talking about the Christians. Why are the Christians willing to be persecuted? For the sake of righteousness. I, as a Christian, will, would, would be willing to be persecuted because of righteousness, because of holiness, because this is what I'm called to. Matthew 19.12 this speaks of eunuchs. Eunuchs is someone, it says, that are incapable of marriage because they were born so. So these are people that are not marrying. People that choose to not marry. These are celibate people. Why are they celibate? Well, the, the scripture gives three categories. It says some are incapable of marriage. They were born that way. Uh, some were made that way. Um, and, and then some, and this is the one we're focused on, because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom. So for the sake of the kingdom... For the sake of the kingdom, I will renounce marriage. Okay, and this is where we get part of our teaching of celibacy. Okay, the celibate priesthood. Why would a, why would a person, why would a man choose to, to be celibate for the sake of the kingdom? A priest does not become, uh, does not choose to be celibate because he, he hates women or because he hates marriage. Um, he sees marriage and women as a good, and he's willing to give up that good for the good of the kingdom. So the choice of being celibate, the choice of, of not being married and giving up marriage, it, it's that you're able to do that for the kingdom. And this is not just for priests, this is also for religious, this is also for consecrated virgins, and, and even some lay people that will choose to say, I want to remain celibate, I will renounce marriage, just so that I can serve the kingdom. Um, as we move into Luke, we see the first one from Luke. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and denounce your name as evil on the account of the Son of Man. So, on the account of the Son of Man, or for the sake of the Son of Man, you could even say because of the Son of Man, who is Jesus, What's going to happen to the Christian? Well, it says people will hate you. People will exclude you. Insult you. And even say you're evil. 
They will take your name in the mud. They will, it says, um, they will denounce your name as evil. So, to be hated, to be excluded, insulted, called evil, and denounced. Why? Why would the Christian choose this? Why, why would anyone choose to be hated, excluded, insulted, denounced, and called evil? The Christian will choose to do this for the Son of Man, for Jesus Christ. Luke 18, 29 said, And he said to them, Truly I say to you, this is Jesus' words, Truly I say to you, there is not one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom. So once again, for the sake of the kingdom, there are going to be people that leave their house, their wife, their brothers, parents, and children. The Christian, once again, is willing to give up house, wife, brothers, parents, and children. Why? For the sake of the kingdom. Now, we want to just kind of talk a little bit about this one. Because it seems obviously drastic. It seems that these things are becoming very drastic already. Um, <laughs> to be a Christian is to be very drastic because, remember, Jesus Christ is a sign of contradiction. And we, as Christians, are followers of Christ. So we, too, will be a sign of contradiction. We will be persecuted, renounced. Uh, we, we may have to renounce marriage, you know, persecuted, hated, excluded, denounced, insulted. We, we, we may be called to give up house, wife, brothers, parents, and children. But let's talk a little bit about this one. You know, and there's a perfect example. There's an American saint, uh, Blessed Francis uh, Silos. And, and uh, Blessed Silos, who, who uh, worked, you know, in, uh, in America, but he, he actually ended up dying in New Orleans, and that was his final place of, of work, his final parish, and, and the place where he died. Um, but Francis Silos, the reason um, he came over to America is he was from Germany, and he had heard that the German immigrants were losing their faith. Many of the German immigrants that came over to America they had no German uh, priest to, to pastor them. And so as the German immigrants came over, uh, they had no sacraments, they had no mass, and so they would fall to, um, to other faiths. They would go to other faiths, uh, Lutheran or whatever that was available. And when uh, Blessed Silos had heard this, he said, I, I want to go to America and I want to be there for my fellow countrymen, these Germans that need a priest. And when, it, when, he, when this bishop told him, if you do this, you will never see your country again. You won't be back in Germany. We can't bring you back. So once you go, you're gone. So it is true that Francis Silos and so many missionaries, they gave up house. They've already renounced marriage. They've given up wife and children. They give up their own family, their own brothers, and their own parents. Missionary after missionary, no matter where they're going. And in America, we're indebted to these missionaries that gave up their homeland. They gave up the food that they loved. They gave up the customs that they loved. They gave up even maybe the language that they loved to speak. Um, they gave up parents, family, to come. And why did they do it? For the sake of the kingdom. For the sake of the kingdom, I will go to this land that I know nothing. I don't even know the language. I could get killed. Um, and I will be willing to do this. For the sake of the kingdom, I will give up these things. Now, kind of on another side, how many people... Um, want to become Catholic? How many people desire to become Catholic and go through the preparation necessary to be initiated into the church? Many of those people that desire to be Catholic have to give up parents, maybe children, maybe even spouses, because their spouses don't support them. Children don't support them, their parents. Now, this may not be physically giving these people up, but they give up the support. They give up, um, you know, the, this, the, the, the people in their family don't support this decision. So we always have to remember that we can begin to worship these things. Because these are good, because our house, our wife, brothers, parents, and children, because our family is good, we can easily put these things in front of God. We can easily worship these things rather than God. And so, for instance, if our spouse says to us, I want you to do this, but the thing that they want you to do is contrary to God's law, is contrary to the teachings of the church. You have to always side with the church. In that case, you're willing to give up that for the sake of the kingdom. 
When we go to Acts, uh, this is St. Paul speaking here. In all of these cases, we're talking about the Christians. It's the Christians that are willing to do this. In these next two cases, this is going to be about Paul. And in Acts, Paul says this. He says, for the, for the sake of the hope of Israel, for the hope of Israel, I am willing to be imprisoned. Um, it says that I will be imprisoned in chains. Once again, why will he do this? For the hope of Israel. You know, as a Jewish person, he knows all of this in the Old Testament that we just discussed. He knows that this is the hope of Israel, and I, for the hope of Israel, will, will be willing to be chained and imprisoned. Um, in 1 Corinthians 9.22, St. Paul says, in this pretty famous verse, For the sake of the gospel, I will become all things to all people. For the sake of the gospel... To spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, I will become all things to all people. Now, this of course is excluding sin. He's not gonna he's not gonna become sinful or in any way give up his holiness, but it does mean you could sum this up by saying Paul is willing to sacrifice. He will willing to sacrifice anything so that he can preach the gospel. That means that he will speak to people that maybe he'd rather not speak to. He will go distances that he probably would not want to travel. He may eat food that he probably doesn't want to eat or have less sleep than he probably wants. Anything that he will do. I will become all things to all people um, for the sake of preaching the gospel, Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, um, it says, For we who live are constantly being given up to death for the sake of Jesus so that life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So for the sake of Jesus, I will be given up to death. I will be willing to be martyred, given up to death. Um, and this is why Tertullian will say that the blood of the martyrs, the blood of those that are willing to give, be given up to death for the sake of Jesus, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. If we look just for a second, you know, th this is the, the uh, mission statement of the Christian. That I will be persecuted, even if that persecution means martyrdom. I will, I will renounce marriage if I need to serve the kingdom. I will be hated, excluded, insulted, denounced, called evil. I might have to give up house, wife, brothers, parents, children. I will be imprisoned, and I will have to make continual sacrifice out of love for people. How in the world did Christianity grow when these are the demands of the Christian? That's the irony of this, is that it, it grew because this is the life of Christ. And in this, people saw Christ, and in this, people saw truth um, in life. The last one, 3 John, uh, this is the, the third book of John. It says, Beloved, you are faithful in all that you do for the brothers, especially for strangers. They have testified to your love before the church. Please help them in any way worthy of God to continue, um, to continue their service, their journey. For they have set out for the sake of the name and are accepting nothing from the pagans. So they will, for the sake of the name of Jesus, for the sake of the name of Jesus, for the sake of the name, they will be willing to set out without pay. They're going to go anywhere without pay. And we really, um, you know, returning back to the missionaries, you know, we think uh, and we're indebted to, to this, you know, all of these characteristics of a missionary. When we think of someone like uh, St. Isaac Jogue, who, who worked with the Indians, uh, the Iroquois, he, he was, he was persecuted, um, he was mistreated, but yet he continued to serve, he continued to serve. When we think of the Franciscans that, that came into uh, the New World, that came to Mexico and then, and then came up through uh, you know, Texas and New Mexico, Arizona and California, when we think of these Franciscans that worked in the South and the Southwest, you know, we think of the vows that they took. 
You know, when a, when a Franciscan takes a vow of chastity, obedience, and poverty, you know, I'm setting out without pay. I'm taking a vow of poverty. I'm going to be obedient. Um, and I'm going to be chaste. I have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom. I have set out with pay for the sake of Jesus Christ. Um, and so there, it eliminates some of the threat. You know, when a missionary comes in and says, look, you know, the fear would be you're here to take my money. He says, I'm not here to take your money. I have taken a vow of poverty. You're here to mistreat or rape our women. I am not here to do anything to your women. I have taken a vow of celibacy. Um, oh, then you must be here to tell us what to do. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I've taken a vow of obedience, and I've taken a vow to, to the church to, to, um, for the salvation of your soul and to teach you what is good. So in all these cases, you know, we see what it is that the Christian is called to. And, and why is the Christian willing to do all of this? You know, when you think of, do I want to be a Christian? If you're interested in becoming a Christian, and, you know, you think, this is my mission statement. This is what I would be willing to do. Why would I do all these things? I would do them for Jesus. I would do them for the kingdom of God. I will do them for the hope of Israel, the hope of the past. I will do them for the sake of holiness, for the sake of righteousness. So, when we look at both of these sides, when we look at the Old Testament, who is doing all the action? All the action is being done by God. Our loving, our just, and merciful Father, God, is doing all the action. Who is He doing it for? He's doing it for us. He's doing it for mankind. He's doing it for His servant, His people. Um, because of His name, because of His servant, but He's acting. It's God giving mercy to man. Now, when we look on this side, we see who is doing all the action here. It's always the Christian that is doing the action for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of, of the kingdom of God. And so in this case, it's man. And what is he truly doing this for? He's doing it for God. He's doing it for Jesus Christ, who is God. He is doing it for the kingdom of God. So it's man giving to God. So we look at this, Old Testament, God is acting towards man. In the New Testament, it's man, it's the, it's the Christian acting towards God, or giving back to God. And this really um, you know, comes to light when we say the words of Jesus, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be given mercy. Um, you know, God is giving mercy to man. In this case, man is responding to that mercy and saying, God, you have been merciful to me, I now want to give to you. And in this case, we see two things, that, that man is giving to God, which is love of God, but also man is loving his neighbor. So on this side in the New Testament, we see that mankind, by reciprocating the mercy of God, that man is truly living out the uh, two greatest commandments of love of God and love of neighbor. We love God. Why do we love God? Because He has given us so much mercy. Because He has first loved us. Why do we love our neighbor? Well, we could love our neighbor for two reasons. One, we genuinely love our neighbor. Um, but what about when we don't feel like loving our neighbor? Well, what about when we don't feel like loving our spouse, or feel like loving our children, or feel like loving our boss, or our friends? There are times when we do not want to love our neighbor. And so why do we love our neighbor? We love our neighbor out of love for God. We love our neighbor because God has told us to love our neighbor. So it's a choice to love. Our feelings may say, hey, you don't feel like loving this person now. But we, we love our neighbor um, either out of love for our neighbor or because of our love for God. And, and this could obviously change in time. Now, if we look at this whole picture, Old Testament, New Testament, we see that how is it that the Christian I mean, this, this list is amazing. How is it that the Christian is able to be endure persecution and even death? How is it that they're able to renounce the good of marriage and be celibate and go out without pay if necessary? How is it they're able to endure imprisonment, sacrifice, 
And how is it that they're able to be hated, excluded, denounced, insulted, called evil, um, and even give up the things most precious to them? How is the Christian able to do this? This is actually impossible without Jesus Christ. The Christian cannot do this without Christ. Jesus Christ says to his apostles, you will do greater things than I. How can we do greater things than Jesus? It's only with him, through him, and in him, which is what we say at the Mass. You know, when the, when the host is elevated, when Jesus Christ is elevated, you know, it's, it's with him, in him, through him. So the Christian is able to do all of this in, with, and through Jesus Christ. So the one thing that seems to be missing here is Jesus Christ. We have God here, and we have man here, but right in the middle of all of this, Right in the middle is Jesus Christ. Right in the middle is the cross. So if you can imagine the cross being right here, what's happening with the mercy, and this is where we go back to the Divine Mercy Chaplet, for the sake of His sorrowful passion, for the sake of His sorrowful passion, have mercy on us, God, and on the whole world. And so all of the mercy flows from the cross. All of the mercy flows from the pierced side of Jesus Christ, from which all mercy flows. The blood and the water that is, is flowing from his side. The water is baptism. The blood is, um, is, is the Eucharist. is the sacrifice. From this, all mercy flows. And so you can almost see Jesus on this side of the cross, you know, kind of reaching back and, and taking all of that mercy from the Old Testament. Think about this. In the Old Testament, it was a service. I was God was showing mercy because of his servants. Because of his servant David, his servant Jacob, his servant um, Abraham. How much more so will he show mercy for the servant of servants? For the suffering servant, his son, Jesus Christ. It says here, I will, show, I will show mercy because of my holy name. How much more mercy will he show for the name of Jesus Christ? The name that became flesh. The word becoming flesh. And it says here, for the sake of the name of Jesus we will do this. It says, for the servant David, Jesus Christ is the son of David. Right? Um, I won't destroy Judah. Well, Judah, Jesus Christ, is the king of Judah. He is, sits on the throne of Judah. He's in the line of Judah. These Psalms talk about, you will lead me on the right path, restore my strength, deliver us, pardon us, give us life, and lead me out of distress. I will liberate you. Um, all of that happens through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way that is our right path. right? He delivers us and pardons us our sins, and He is the way, the truth, and the life. I will give you life. All of the promises and mercy of the Old Testament all center on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, with His hand reached out, is the promise, the connection. And then also in the New Testament, He reaches out His hand here to say, I will give mercy in the New Testament um, because I will give strength to the Christian and I will allow them to be merciful to others because they have received my mercy. So all of this that the Christian does never does it separate from the cross. Never does it separate from Christ. Any work that we do as a Christian, anything we endure, is always connected to Christ our work is never alone. It is the work of Christ. This is done most perfectly at the Mass. Because at the Mass, this crucifixion is represented in time to us. Um, this, this crucifixion is given to us and to every generation. You know, remember in, in the, the Magnificat, He will be merciful to every generation. Um, all generations receive His mercy. How do all generations receive His mercy? Through the cross which is given to us at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.